Welcome back to Theme Park Wizard. I have very special guest John from Theme Park Tribune here. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining all the way from Orlando. It's Orlando, right? No, actually. I live in Chicago. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Wait, that's incredible. <laughs> what? How is this to be? <laughs> I've always lived in, in Chicago. I go down to Orlando plenty. I've covered the parks from afar, but no, I'm not in Orlando. I thought it was in Orlando. <laughs> Insane. Well, oops, so it's only 8 o'clock there now. Okay, cool. Not bad. So what got you interested in theme parks? Uh, well, you know, I, I only got like really, really into it in the past few years. But when I was thinking back on this, I've kind of, it's kind of always been there. I you know, went to Disney World for the first time when I was six, and I went uh, two other times you know, before I turned 18. And even then, I was doing things like looking around for a book about like the history of Walt Disney World and Disneyland when I was there and asking questions about the history of the park. And I can't. I can't even remember how many times I used to watch the old VHSs, the planning VHSs that they sent to everyone. So it was kind of always there. It <laughs> fell off when I was an adult. And then I had to go down to Orlando for a business trip. It sprung to mind like I haven't gone to uh, a Disney World park. i had never been to Universal at that point. Um, mm -hmm. This was only 2017. Go mm -hmm. down there, oh, fell in yeah. love with it. And I, I'm a journalist for a living that's this is an on a side gig i do but my day job is as a journalist and i got more interested in let's try to marry those two parts of my world this new love of theme parks and uh journalism and that's that's kind of where it all came together but only in the past five years have become you know so heavily invested in it wow so what was the gap so you said you came in 2017 before that you're like six so like how went was it how how many years of a gap was that? There were a few in there because I, I came in the first trip I did it was in '94. Mm -hmm. Then I came again in 2000 mm -hmm. during you know the Millennium Celebration at Disney mm -hmm. World. My family spent a week there. We came again in 2005, and then prior to that, my family had gone to Disneyland and DCA in I believe it was like two like probably late summer of 2001. So like I got to see DCA and it's like first, first year of operation and stuff oh, like wow. that. Um, I might've been on superstar limo. I don't remember if I frankly, <laughs> <laughs> stuff like that. So there were, there were a few in there. I would go to my, my local six flags park, six flags, great America. And uh, probably once every couple of years, but wasn't heavily invested into it until you know, 2017. And it grabbed me. Wow. Okay. So that's when you made Theme Park Tribune in 2017, or did you make that later? A little bit later. I then got interested in how can I go about writing about this. Mm -hmm. um, and the first thing I did was I did a few blog posts for the unofficial Universal Orlando podcasts. Um, mm -hmm. And then I did, and I picked up then a gig on a site that was then called Orlando Rising as their theme park contributor. I didn't own it at the time. It was owned by another website um, affiliated with a website called Florida Politics, uh, just a straight up news site. And then Orlando Rising was meant to be their local Orlando site. It didn't really work out. And then in, in 2019, they said they were going to uh, shut the site down. And I offered instead to buy it and then turn it into my own website that was dedicated solely to theme parks rather than just the theme park reporting I had on the site previously. And then as time went on, I was finding myself going to Disneyland a little more than, than Disney world. Mm -hmm. And uh, I decided I wanted to be able to cover everything. So I changed the name to theme park tribune. I was never that crazy about the Orlando rising name. It was just <laughs> that was handed to me. And I wanted a name that kind of reflected what I was trying to do. Theme park journalism. I thought theme park mm -hmm. tribune kind of fit that mold. Yeah, that's a, that's a great name because yeah, Tri Tribune screams newspaper, and of course, theme park. That was so, the, that was my thought too. <laughs> yeah, is it especially like Chicago? Right, Chicago has the Chicago Tribune. Isn't that their main um their main paper? There? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's and that that's kind of what you know. And here, that's what we when we think of journalism, we think of the Tribune. So that yeah. spoke to me when trying to come up with names. Yeah, thank you. Blending home journalism and theme parks into one. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, is it a one man show, or do you have other people writing with you, or is it just just you that writes it? It is me and some, I have some contributors that come off and on. Uh, I always take submissions. I always look over what other people want to pitch me. Um, but the vast bulk of the reporting is me writing what I want to write about, either the news of the day, the reviews I want to do, or when I have time to do bigger stories, doing stuff like that. Oh, wow. That's, that, that is nice. I like that. So that's, you said you still have, that's still your side gig or you still do something like uh, you're still a journalist for something else or is that your full time? No, the theme park Tribune stuff is just a side gig. Um, I know I still, I'm still a journalist during the day. Um, my specialty in that realm is covering health misinformation, a lot more serious topic. So <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, Although that blended into, I feel like they could blend in the theme part at least the past couple of years. <laughs> in a way. It, it did. It did in some ways. Uh, those <laughs> worlds got merged a little more than I would have liked or that frankly <laughs> anyone would have liked in the past few years. But, uh, you know, this offers a nice little respite while still, you know, I still like to say I'm bringing the journalistic rigor to things and trying to tell stories in a way that I might think other theme park sites might not be doing exactly mm -hmm. right. Uh, and you know, marrying those two worlds, but yeah, it's, it's still just a side gig. So what types of stories, obviously you do the big news and any announcements, but do you do any side things? I heard a thing you mentioned like reviews and anything. Do you do any side things that, like you said, maybe not other theme park sites would do on your site? Uh, well, I'm sure a lot of them would do reviews. They all do. Yeah. Um, I like, and, and I just like doing them because, you know, uh, I think I'll always do them honestly. I'll hold myself to that standard. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little more interested in, frankly, it seems like readers are too. They like hearing about the things like offsite, especially in Orlando and seeing mm -hmm. what those options look like. Like, you know, I did a review of Animal Kingdom Lodge in Old Key West. Mm -hmm. It didn't get the same traffic as me saying like, here's what the $42 you know, Clarion Inn on, on 192 is like. Um, mm -hmm. So sometimes people seem to like that little content of like, let's get off the beaten path and just honestly say, how are some of these other offerings? Mm -hmm. And then as far as the reporting side, I like doing bigger pieces on the history of rides, looking at analysis of like, you know, how the parks are supposed to work, how this ride is supposed to improve things. Um, a big story I did a few years ago when Hagrid's opened at Universal and mm -hmm. was having all that downtime, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure we all remember reading about that. Mm -hmm. And I did a story that grabbed the data and compared how often Hagrid's was down to other recent Disney and Universal rides. And sure mm -hmm. enough, it was down a lot more often. And so those are the bigger stories that I like doing um, that are still, you know, really honed in on the theme park fan, not exactly someone who's very casual in their, um, you know, in, in going to theme parks or hasn't been in a while, but bringing it to... You know, a, a different kind of rigor than just, hey, here's the new cupcake or yeah. let's, let's complain about IP being in Disney parks or complain about Bob <laughs> Chapek, that sort of thing. It's the stuff oh, that man. I would like to think I would read um, if if I was just you know, a passive reader on this sort of stuff. And that's what I want to deliver. See, yeah, that's pretty what I like that. That's the actual statistics. Of things like Haggers, yeah, because they had quite a bit of downtime over there, but it seems to be fine and dandy now, which is great, you know. Luckily, luckily, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of near, not a lot of things going on in Hagrid's, Hagrid, so it makes sense that a lot of downtime, but yeah, Universal <laughs> figure that out. And with speaking, since you're in uh, Orlando a lot or cover Orlando a lot, you no, know, Icon Park, the theme park safety. What do you? What are your thoughts on the the drop tower incident? Well, um, it's it's not really the most serious theme park tragedy in Orlando that I can remember in the mm -hmm. past. You know, five years. I can't recall something getting this much press coverage um, because of how you not know, visible the inc the incident was. Mm -hmm. um, the 
you know, a pretty instant reaction. And then all the questions about whose fault was this? And a lot of it, at least preliminary, at least the preliminary reports and everything are really pointing to this was some sort of mistake on the part of ride operators by even mm -hmm. letting uh, this, this young man on the ride. Um, I don't think a lot of people outside of Florida really know how these the state's regulations on theme park inspections even work. They don't really, uh, they don't understand that it's for a lot of the biggest theme parks, it's not the state or the county or any sort of government entity doing those inspections. It's just the parks. They're kind of trusted to police themselves. Icon Park is a different scenario where they do have to undergo those inspections. It's a, um, the limit is you have to have at least a thousand employees and then you're exempt from those standards. And here, while it's certainly not in any park's interest to leave guests like unsafe, mm -hmm. you have to question, were the safety inspections here sufficient? Was there sufficient training? Was there really enough oversight of these young, I'm guessing hourly paid ride operators mm -hmm. who couldn't have been working there long? The ride's only been open for three months. Yeah. Um, and was there, could there have been some extra layer of scrutiny where they should have been trained to recognize, hey, this person's too big to go on this ride, even if someone else had taken that person, you know, the, the young man's money and waved him in when they shouldn't have. And it's that sort of layering effect that I think is going to be scrutinized really heavily and see, is there something more that they can, than they could have taught these ride operators to have prevented something like this rather than letting them rely a little too much on just the safety lights, other indicators, and not some, you know, some common sense or just better training. Yeah, because I think even one of those videos or the beginning of them, I think one of the, one of the ride operators asking if the restraint was on correct or something. And I feel like at that moment, they should just, just stop and double check anyway, you know? It's, yeah, it's a little strange because, you know, that ride has enough capacity and frankly, not very rarely a long line, at least the little bit I saw of it. Mm -hmm to where you'd be, you'd think they were so concerned with like fast dispatches. They can take yeah. that time to check the restraints. If anyone has a little bit of complaint, the worst thing they find is like, yeah, it's secure. Cause it's not unheard of for a rider to think they're insecure in some sort of restraint when they're totally fine. Mm -hmm. I was remembering an incident that happened, I think like 15 or 20 years ago at King's Dominion up in Virginia, where a kid was secure in his restraint and believed he wasn't and actually managed to wriggle out and jump off while they were going up the lift hill. Oh, wow. um, I don't remember which ride that was, but it's that sort of thing where sometimes the, you know, the rider can get a little overly panicky, but mm -hmm. in this case, I don't see why there would have been any harm in just checking it. You're not, you're not really trying to hit a super fast dish dispatch time on that ride when there's eh, not that many people like waiting that long to ride it anyway. Yeah, exactly. And especially yeah, if there's like multiple people kind of asking, I'd, I feel like, you know, I just have a peace of mind. Even if I have to, even if the ride's like already started, I'd bring it back down, like, hold on, let's double check real quick. Cause, you know, you never know. But yeah, I, yeah, you know, just like I know with a Harry Potter Forbidden Journey, there's certain size requirements and height requirements. And I worked that ride for a little bit and we had to take people off and, and fit the, the, requirements what they try to sneak in and well there's a good reason why people there's a good reason why <laughs> yeah no i mean and especially it seems pretty clear based on the manufacturer's um report like the fact that we know this without much investigation it took you know a day or two for those mm -hmm. details to come out it's all pointing in the direction that this was an operator error and mm -hmm. i'm not gonna you know as, as tragic as this was i think that goes down to the training should have been better to pick mm -hmm. up on those sort of things. And there should have been more layers where any sort of mistake by one person gets caught or at least potentially caught by someone else. So what happens now? Do you think Icon Park should stay in business? Yeah. Right? Isn't, I think isn't like, it wasn't, there was another incident, wasn't there at Icon I was reading about, not like recently, but like in the years prior with the, the was it the slingshot ride? I think there's something, um, I don't know what happened. I was reading someone posted something about that. I'm not too familiar with that park, but do you think there should be more regulations with that park? Or what do you think should happen? Do you think the ride should ever reopen? And do you think it was bad that they didn't at least close the whole park for at least one day to kind of investigate what was happening? 
All good questions. Um, let me let me take the the, the last one first. <laughs> uh, threw a lot at me there, but I'll get I'll get to all of it. Um, like the Icon Park works, where a lot of these attractions there are not operated by the same company. Mm -hmm. um, they're they're different subcontractors at Icon Park, um, which is part of the reason why Icon Park had to ask the the operator of the Freefall Ride, the Slingshot Group to close that and the Orlando slingshot that's next to it, even though the slingshot didn't have an incident recently. Mm -hmm. um, just basically saying this is under your purview too. We'd like, we'd like to kn know that both of these rides are safe and uh, that your procedures are, you know, all kosher on both ends. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know whether other rides at Icon Park necessarily need to be closed they certainly should be looked at even if they're not operated by the slingshot group better safe than sorry mm -hmm. and make sure that you know frankly even just re-emphasizing safety shutting them down for a few days so those ride ops can get a little extra training would probably get, do huge benefits in peace of mind to get people coming back and trusting those rides that will more than make up for whatever whatever they lose in the short term by just being closed down for a few days. Cause I think the thing that might close this ride permanently is not necessarily some state, like you know, unless they find something defective with the ride itself mm -hmm. and not so I'm sure they're whatever they need, even if they need to add a secondary restraint that can be done. That's happened on other rides when tragic accidents have happened and they've stayed open. But I think what could close the ride permanently is if people don't come back, they don't trust it. And right now that's going to be really tough with how much press coverage this is getting. You know, people probably, a lot of people traveling to Orlando had never heard of this ride. Maybe mm -hmm. they would have been attracted by it by seeing it off in the distance at 430 mm -hmm. feet tall. But now they'll know, oh, that's the ride that, that someone died on. I'm not going on that, no matter what they do after that. So, um It'll be crucial then to just whatever the future of this ride is, is going to depend on what the investigation turns up and how the park responds in sort of a public relations battle, but making people feel safe to ride this again. And what do you think about like all drop towers? I know Dollywood closed theirs out of precaution for a moment. I mean, like even like at Knott's Way from Supreme Scream, obviously different ride manufacturer, but I, I follow the Knott's Facebook group. Someone posted that they're going to Knott's Way Farm, but they're, they're, now terrified to get on Supreme Screen because it's that same type of drop tower. The legs are hanging and they're like, oh, what if I fall out? You know, Knott's has probably way better, definitely has much better safety precautions. They're a major company. But do you think more people, are, a lot of people are going to think like that and maybe kind of avoid drop towers for it a little bit? Or do you think they won't have too much of an impact? No, I think you're right. I think they probably will avoid them for a short bit. And I think places like Dollywood took the right um, – took the right call and saying, let's see, let's make sure everything's okay, that we don't have the same issues, whatever their issues are um, down in, uh, down at the free fall um, in Orlando. And it just gives the guest peace of mind that, Hey, they shut it down for a little bit. They made sure it was okay. I feel safe going on it. Um, there's, you're not going to convince everyone that way. Some people are still going to have their doubts, but I think by, you know, even a temporary closure, or even just saying, we inspected the ride or making making it clear this is not the same kind, this is not the same manufacturer or restraint. That'll give people peace of mind. <clears throat> yeah. Because yeah, I was really curious about that when I saw it. I was like, oh, but Sup Sup Supreme Screen, that's way different. But I can understand why that person was a little bit, a little bit um con you know, concerned, even though it looks completely different, but the same type of idea. Now with Florida specifically, because Obviously, Icon Park is just a little tiny park, but I wonder because there's this incident, then of course the that new that bill in Florida, um, with all Florida theme parks attendance. Do you think the Florida theme park attendance in general will take a hit? Well, because maybe some people will think that they because I see on the news they just say amusement park right in Florida, and like you said, a lot of people probably don't know right Icon exists, so some people may think, oh. Disney added this new ride or Universal added this new ride and oh my gosh, it, it, someone died on it. I'm not going to Disney World for a long time, even though it's obviously not in Disney World. Do you think the parks attendance over there from the general public may take a hit with that? Plus maybe 
if they, people don't agree with Florida's legislation or politics, you think attendance to Florida theme parks could drop? That I, I would think not. Um, I think the only like for the rides, I think the only one that could possibly be affected is someone maybe being a little scared of Dr. Doom's uh, uh, fearful. Fearful, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> free fall, fearful. They're all they're all not knocking around the brain. The only because that visually will look mm -hmm. a little similar to to most guests, even if it's a different mm -hmm. kind of ride. It goes up, it gets shot up rather than down. <laughs> yeah. The restraints are different, all that. But the, yeah, they might think a little. They might think twice about going on that. I don't think it would make them not come down because, frankly, I don't. I can't remember the last time Universal heavily promoted that ride. In, in any of their marketing anyway it's not a premier ride there um and then i don't think disney would get roped in because you know they don't have anything that's similar that's visible outside they don't have an outdoor drop tower mm -hmm. um so i don't think people would look at that the same and frankly any anything with that plus any you know controversies over over the bill down there i don't think that can dampen the the pent up demand that people have for vacations and traveling right now. Mm -hmm. um, I see it myself by trying to tr plan some future trips mm -hmm. and seeing uh, the airfares oh, yeah. re really go up. Yeah. <laughs> really go up. <laughs> yeah. And I just don't think it can, I don't think anything can slow it. If it made a dent, it wouldn't, it would still, you know, they would still be, uh, you know, in positive territory just because of all that pent up demand. So I don't think mm -hmm. it'll have enough of an impact for anyone to really notice. Mm -hmm. And speaking of that bill, obviously, uh, let's see, uh, people like well, Bob Schaefer got pressure to say something, um, but the other theme park companies haven't gotten pressure to say anything and haven't said something. Do you think that's a good thing, bad thing, smart thing, terrible thing? Do you think they should do it behind the scenes or just not keep going and not do anything? <laughs> well, I mean, I don't want to get it. We can put aside the bill itself discussing that because really that's a discussion for people outside of theme parks. They can, yeah. they can do that. As far as the response, I mean, it's no, it's really nothing new that Disney and Comcast donate to many, many members of the Florida legislature. Republicans have majorities in both houses. So most of the money is going to go to Republicans. They're the one that are going to push bills through. Um, so that's nothing new. Disney's just been getting most more of the attention for one because they did donate more. It's considerably more um, cumulative, you know, compared to Comcast. It's about like two hundred thousand dollars from Disney and like twenty eight thousand from Comcast. Oh yeah, that's like and, ten yeah, times more. <laughs> yeah, a lot. It's, it is a lot more, and it's just Disney is the more prominent thing. That's the one that's more associated with Central Florida than Comcast because. Plenty of people are probably not even make a connection that Comcast owns Universal. <laughs> um, now, I think Comcast should come out and say something. They haven't answered multiple requests for comment from me, and I, you know, I personally like transparency and getting responses to what I think are legitimate questions about what do they, what's their stance on the bill? Will they take some of the same moves as Disney? Why or why not? But. Um, They've just been able to stay under the radar, I think, because of the kind of attention Disney attracts and how they're more associated with Orlando. Mm -hmm. So um, right or wrong, it's what they've done. And uh, I think Disney would you know, give a lot of money to just get out of the headlines on this topic. <laughs> and I don't think Comcast is probably in no rush now to dive into it if they can help it. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And uh, since Disney has gone into it and kind of, picked a fight with Florida. It's funny. Disney picked a fight with California. Or, or it was in a fight with California. Now they're kind of in a fight with Florida. Do you think if they if the Reedy Creek, you know, gets taken away or gets dissolved, do you think Disney should continue to move the Imagineers to Lake, uh, Lake Nona or bring them back here? That would be one effort they could to kind of retaliate against the retaliation is mm -hmm. to you know, kind of hit at Florida. Like, you're going to take that away from us. We're going to take these jobs and these things away from you. Disney would be leaving a lot of tax credits on the table if they did that because they are getting plenty of tax incentives to move to the Imagineers to Florida. Mm -hmm. So whether they do that, because that's a pretty, that's a pretty bold move that would just escalate things. 
Mm-hmm. I don't think that will be threatened unless there's a real danger of the Reedy Creek Improvement Act being repealed. And it remains to be seen whether some of this is just political gamesmanship, scoring mm-hmm. some quick points, or whether these are serious legislative discussions. We'll have to see. Um, but uh, I think, again, Disney would just like this issue to not be in the headlines and for their PR team to get one win, their new PR <laughs> team under Bob Chabak, to get one win and just have <laughs> and some quiet stuff happen. All of yeah. a sudden, uh, you know, then Bob Iyer kind of came in there with a little dig on Chabak. I'm like, oh, poor Chabak. He's getting hit from all over the place. <laughs> um, it, I mean, he had a risk averse approach here. And I don't think, you know, whether what, whatever side you are on the legislation itself, I don't think anyone would argue that their PR strategy worked here because, you know, yeah. uh, having, you know, working in journalism, you can tell when a PR strategy is and isn't working. Um, they're the people we deal with a lot. And it's never a good sign when your apology is followed by another apology. Yeah. You're not winning the PR battle. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's that's no good. Oh boy! And speaking of that, do you agree? Not even the bill or anything, but like the the um the Imagineers move. I know a lot of Imagineers no didn't want to move to Florida um, for whatever reason. You know, for the whole lives here, they've been some been here probably for decades. They also have to move across countries. Some are, some are LGBT and don't want to go over there. Um, some, for whatever reason, don't want to go. Do you agree? Or do you agree with the move to Florida? Or would you want? Would you prefer imaginary stay here in Glendale? That's a good question because um, you know, taking out the the political aspect of it and mm-hmm. and whether you know they. They should you know whether they're right to not want to move to Florida for for political reasons, for social, for the kind of legislation that's being passed there. All of that. I I didn't have the same kind of visceral reaction that some other you know Disney influencers and bloggers and personalities had to this announcement because there's always been this I think accurate sense that Imagineers who are based in California design things too much for Disneyland and don't consider Disney world enough in those designs. And that's when you get things like toy story land, having zero shade and uh, yeah. like and Disney, California thing. Yeah. Or Disney's um, D- Disney world's version of a galaxy's edge, like flooding more often because it was designed for a place where it rains five days a year or things yeah. like that. And, and I can see the advantage of, Imagineers being based where their largest concentration of theme parks are and not based uh, no, miles away, many miles away from even Disneyland and not getting into the parks more often. I mean, really where I, if I, anything, I would disagree with it being in Lake Nona, it should be on like the back of Epcot and they should have <laughs> to like get in like lightning lane queues and see how this stuff really works before they mm-hmm. plan it. So I don't that. necessarily think the Florida thing is a bad move I'm because mm-hmm. I think it would help them look at those parks differently mm-hmm. and have a little bit better balance. They could do some of that in Burbank too if they just got down to Disneyland a little more often, if they had a bit a bigger presence in Florida, but not the entire team here. Um, mm-hmm. And I also, I mean, in the end, I wasn't that concerned with it mattering as much as the brain drain that was already happening with Imagineering, already Mm -hmm. seeing Imagineers leave more stuff being outsourced to outside companies, Imagineering being framed more as a brand than an actual division that has a lot Mm -hmm. of power and a lot of people behind it anymore. I think that was the much bigger problem rather (laughs) than where they're based. And the argument for them being based here is look what it's done with Universal Creative. They've been here for decades, not based in California. They're based on where their bigger theme parks are. And I think mm-hmm. that's worked out extremely well for them. True. And yeah, one thing I do agree with is all park operations, no matter what state you're in, should be, like you said, in the back of the park. You know, like TDA is right behind Toontown. You know, you can, these things with Burbank, Burbank's you know, miles away, you know, could be a couple of hours away in traffic. Lake Nona, I'm not I'm not too familiar with photos. I don't know how far or close that is to Orlando or the Disney World property, but they it's hard to see what's happening in your park 
if you're not like looking at it and experience like a regular guest, if you're using a VIP pass and just go, oh, yeah, let me go. It's hard to see day to day operations, but unless you're just unless you're an actual guest, you go there from 8 a.m. to midnight and you sit in the long lightning lane lines that stretched all the way to Ventures Campus. You know, these people more so in all companies seem to make decisions, but not actually experience these things. And there's just Oh, this looks good on based on the math and statistics of this computer program. Let's do it. Oh, look how much money we'll make. Let's do it. And then they don't actually see the mess they potentially create. Right. And there and you no know, Disney history is filled with little examples of things they learned that they only could have learned by being in the parks and they recognized mm -hmm. the problems and something got done. That's what Walt insisted the original Imagineers go experience it in the park like a regular guest. Mm -hmm. And then um, like one little quick aside of like a time where this, that sort of uh, in-person feel resulted in change was back when Jeffrey Katzenberg was the head of the Disney studio. He took a vacation to Disney world and kept trying to get into river country mm -hmm. and couldn't get in. He's the president of the studio. He can't get into their water park because it was such low capacity. And that eventually snowballed into them creating Typhoon Lagoon. It's that sort of thing where if you're not on the ground, you don't experience it the way the guest does, you can dismiss those complaints and those surveys that you get. Whereas mm -hmm. if you see it with your own eyes, those creative people, some things might go off and we might get some really great things and an improved guest experience. If they're sitting in a place in Glendale and they don't experience firsthand, like you said, they just get a VIP pass, not the same thing. Exactly. I feel, I feel like that should be part of their job description or like a mandate. They should one day a month just go in, that's their work day, go experience the park with their family, bring their kids too, because kids, a lot of them are pretty impatient. So if they get in a long lightning lane line or long line, they'll start yapping. And then they're like, hmm, maybe we should we should make some changes to help these things. There should be a one day a month, all theme parks, whole families to go. That's their day at work. And then just kind of jot down notes. Okay, all right, what's happening here? Well, you know, and I feel like we get some nice modest improvements. Yeah, absolutely. Man. And so... Have you been to international theme parks or just the United States? Just the United States, unfortunately. Um, most of the stuff that would be on my bucket list is outside of the United States. Um, but no, nothing outside of the U.S. And frankly, there's still a bunch in the U.S. that I still need to visit. What's your bucket list international park and your bucket list um, U.S. park? Oh, for, for international, like definitely, you know, Tokyo Disneyland and Tokyo mm -hmm. Disney Sea. Um, I'm sure most people feel that way, but just you know, mm -hmm. hearing about how different the guest experience is to the better attractions to the, I mean, Disney sea being, you know, always talked up as the most beautiful Disney park, um, what they can do with an unlimited budget, that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. That's absolutely, those would be on my bucket list along with, um, with universal studios, Japan, um, mm -hmm. and just seeing the different, you know, different offerings there. It will be a little less appealing once Super Nintendo World is open here, because right mm -hmm. now I think that's the big draw for most Americans to get out there, and they can't. Thanks Although to COVID it's still bigger, so it's not. It, yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then outside of Disney or Universal, um, it would probably be uh, Europa Park. Yeah, that's Germany. My, yeah, that's my non-Disney Universal Park. That looks gorgeous. That one. Yeah, um, and 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 movie park Germany. Along with that, yeah, I I tend to gravitate to you know the site's called Theme Park Tribune and not just like <laughs> Roller Coaster Park Tribune. While yeah. I love coasters, mm -hmm. I give a lot more credit and and it just frankly gets me excited more to see like theming thought of and not mm -hmm. just and not just like a Six Flags or lower tier Cedar Fair sort of experience. That's exactly. what that's. I, I And I don't think you need to sacrifice thrills for that sort of thing. So that's the sort of stuff I want to see. And then in the U.S., um, well, one I'll be checking off in a few weeks is Busch Gardens, Williamsburg. I've never been there before. Um, they they actually, I'll, I'll give them one little, <laughs> one, one little snarky comment in that Busch Gardens, Williamsburg, use Theme Park Tribune in their promotional materials for... Um, for Pantheon, and then didn't invite me to the media event. Oh, wow. <laughs> Sassy. That's cold. 
And then the second one would be uh, Evermore in Utah because you know I, I've with all the stuff I've been hearing about Galaxy, uh, Gal- I'm sorry, Gal- Galactic Star Cruiser, people mm-hmm. really being impressed by the live action role playing aspect. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to see something that inspired that at a much lower cost, you know, like you know, a kind of price point, and mm-hmm. Evermore out in Utah with this sort of LARPing and this fantasy theme. I really want to see how someone pulls that off. Um, and, you know, maybe I'll go to Lagoon too and get some coasters in while I'm at it, you know? <laughs> oh yeah. And that's a, uh, you know, Utah's not too, not too, not too, well, at least for me, not too far away. Um, <laughs> what, but people in the West coast, you guys have a different definition of what's too far away. Cause everything's more spaced out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the Midwest or the East coast. <laughs> yeah. That is true. It's really close together about you guys. Yeah, like Vegas, not too far away, but it could be really far away for, let's see, three, four hours. That could be like four, four or five states in the East Coast. That's it's pretty, pretty far. But yeah, the um, what you were talking about with the coasters and sacrificing theming, I totally agree. And that's why Europa Park, I think, is so cool because they have good coasters and really rides for everyone. But even their coasters are pretty well themed. It can be done. I think Velocicoaster should have opened up people's eyes that you don't need to sacrifice That's thrills. Yeah. 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 You don't need to sacrifice thrills for or for theming, vice versa. You can have both. Exactly. Because so many of my my friends here, they're like, um, oh, I want to go to a, I like roller coasters. Like, I like Disneyland, but then they're like, Oh, I want to go to roller coasters, and I seem to separate the two because Six Flags doesn't put any theming in any of the coasters. Um, so they, I feel like they have this automatic like barrier, like there's either cool theme things or big roller coasters, and you know, because Six Flags doesn't really do themed coasters, it really can't. People, at least over here, don't really know that you can do both. They at best they'll do a themed queue. Um, and sometimes exactly. you don't even get that. Sometimes you get then, it'll just be the themed Q station building, and then the rest of it's outdoor <laughs> or in the parking lot, like Scream. Uh, yeah, or in the lot. <laughs> oh man, they could Hopefully. they couldn't they couldn't have painted over the lines. I was like, you know, I, I actually thought <laughs> Scream, I was led to believe it was terrible. And mm. I went out and I'm like, this is pretty good. You know, it's still just a floor list. Those aren't, those aren't usually the best models, but mm-hmm. like, I was kind of met, like just amazed. I'm like, this is built how many years ago? And there's, st- I can still see the old parking lot lines. That's just <laughs> yeah. laziness. <laughs> yeah, that is, it's literally on a, but I even like rip it out and put like some grass. And, nope, just right in the parking lot and hot yeah. 110 degree Valencia. Oh, terrible. Um, and then the Batman queue. One of the most themed queue at Six Flags. It actually they themed. I must say they it seemed very well because when you go in that sewer, it's pretty stinky. <laughs> it's right. it's pretty much the same at Great America with the original <laughs> Batman. It's pretty much the same thing. Our car, the car, uh, the 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 Gotham cop car still works. The lights are still on, and it's still just a little stinky. Um, <laughs> like, they made a li- they made that much more of an effort back in the 90s um, yeah like wow and that all things are theme it to let's theme it to a stinky sewer <laughs> oh six flags you 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 crazy but uh so what are your favorite your favorite coasters been also favorite rides in general so favorite coaster what's your favorite coaster um, keep in mind, I'll, I'll just give a disclaimer. My coaster counts in like the low 100s. I'm not a big time enthusiast well, that has, good. yeah, I, I haven't, I haven't, uh, I like, I, I'm not, I'm not to the point where I'm like picking up every family entertainment, like SBS visa spinner thing. <laughs> um, so, uh, I, Velocicoaster is my number one right now. I think it's the perfect mix of has the theming mm-hmm. has crazy elements with an ultra smooth ride, that just blows everyone away. I haven't seen a bad review of that coaster. And if I did, I would probably assume they're lying anyway. Yeah. Um, and then other ones are like, um, no, two, two in my top five would be at Knott's Ghost Rider and Accelerator. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't been on other, um, of the other, you know, big, big launch coasters like Accelerator. Like I had, I wasn't on Top Thrill Dragster. Maybe I'll get mm-hmm. the chance someday. And I haven't done King to Ka, but man, that launch, I think even beats out um, Max Force at my home park, Great America. It's oh, just yeah, that's your newest one, right? 
Yeah, and which is, I mean, it's a loud launch and it is an intense one, but there's something about that accelerator one that's just, oof, it's just yeah. magical. That one's, uh, that one's quite forceful. We go boom. And I love the new repaint that ride just got, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And then and then as far as overall rides, I'd probably have to put Rise of the Resistance at the top because mm -hmm. it's really, there's nothing else to say other than it's the most complete theme park experience that you can get in the United States. Um, mm -hmm. like what, and what it does so well is I think they've been trying for years to make, you know, obviously make the queues more fun from mm -hmm. the, you know, the scene one games they put in things like seven dwarves, mind train mm -hmm. and Winnie the Pooh to then little interactive elements and in pre-shows. Um, but that, that, that still felt like the, that still felt like waiting. Like when mm -hmm. you get the little spiel before flight of passage, yeah, mm -hmm. you're looking at something and you're being somewhat entertained or at least occupied, but it's still, you know, you know, you're still in the line mm -hmm. um, for rise of the resistance. They really did manage to like hide it. Like, mm -hmm. like I had to explain uh, to my girlfriend when she finally got to ride it recently and like, she didn't understand that we hadn't gotten through the ride yet. Like when we were in the pen, she's like, is this, are we, is this the end of the, the end of the attraction? I'm like, no, no, we haven't even gotten to it yet. <laughs> and the fact that they can hide that so well in this very long experience is just that I feel like that has to be in the top for everyone's list. It's another one of these things where as long as you got to experience it, it didn't break down. You couldn't get a boarding group when that was a thing. It's, I haven't seen a bad review of it. Um, and then other ones that I have sore spots for um, or just you know, are among my favorites are things like Carousel of Progress um, mm. is is one I do every single time. Indiana Jones Adventure. Um, Classic. And then and the, the one that really when I came in my 2017 trip um, to go off on a, on a small tangent, I came in with like so, so little planning and went and decided that I wanted to go to Hollywood studios because I remember that being my favorite as a kid without doing enough research to know that all of that stuff I really liked as a kid, or at least a lot of it was now gone <laughs> because they were building galaxy's edge and toy story. <laughs> and I, and I even went on, you know, president's day weekend. So I was waiting through, like I waited like an hour and a half for star tours and who needs to oh, do wow. that? <laughs> yeah. Things like that. So it wasn't the greatest day. A few days later when I went to universal and I went on Spider-Man that was the one where it was like, oh, this is a, this is next level. It's still the best Spider-Man attraction by far <laughs> in, in the country. Um, and it, it's still one that I think would wow everybody um, and like make them a theme park fan if they weren't already. Yeah, see, I haven't been to the Universal Parks in Orlando, so I'm super excited to finally go, hopefully this summer, and experience Spider-Man myself, because it looks fantastic. Amazing to ride 20-plus years old and still be like chef's kiss over there. Especially for a screen-based ride. Those ones can get exactly. dated pretty quickly, and that they, they've given it the TLC, and the ride system is just that good that mm -hmm. it can still wow people. Like, and it's funny how the Transformers rise is based on the same thing, but that one's uh, certainly not as good. <laughs> it's just, it's it's a little too similar. And then, I mean, people are big Spider-Man fans. There's not everyone's like, no one has a lot of love for the Transformers. Franchise. <laughs> yeah. It's popular, but not beloved. Yeah. Oh, man. And that kind of leads into what are your most anticipated upcoming attractions? They don't have to be opening this year, but just opening the next 10 years or whatever you know about <laughs> like um, the universe could be super nintendo world could be oh i mean those those would both be on it because i mean not only i mean super nintendo world we already know a mm. lot about um we know like orlando's getting pretty much just the full package version hollywood's getting just mario kart but it's going to still be a huge boon for mm. universal studios hollywood um and make you know, the lower lot really the place to be with that plus Jurassic World. Mm -hmm. um, and and then Epic Universe, I mean, there hasn't been, it's going to be the most, ex, you know, the biggest expansion in a U.S. theme park in, you know, a, more than a generation in mm -hmm. about, you know, about 25 years, more than 25 years by the time it opens. And mm -hmm. seeing all that, that knowledge and that, 
the what we know about what the guest experience needs to be like in these days is going to be fascinating to see, along with all the great attractions that you know we know, or at least are rumored to be coming. As far as stuff that's a little bit closer, uh, number one for me would be the Guardians of the Galaxy coaster. Um, yes. It's anticipated. I have a little bit of trepidation with it because I could see it falling flat if it's like if it's like Gringotts 2.0. If it's not, mm -hmm. it needs to be a big leap forward. Epcot needs that. Disney needs that. And frankly, no, they should they should not stumble over themselves with another Marvel attraction like I think they did with Web Slingers. Oh well, yeah, um, no good. It needs to be it needs to be something big, but it could it could very easily be, you know, like Disney's. Ha I, I think Disney is having a problem right now with stuff that was besides Rise of the Resistance where they're having the problem that Universal had a few years ago where they're being it's criticized screen, for being, yeah. yeah, it's 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 screen heavy. Yeah. And like there's a reason why Universal got away with that and maybe Disney has to learn the same the same lesson and I hope Guardians isn't that. I hope it delivers a, a larger experience. Um other stuff in the in, in the more like near future um I'm really interested into what the Lost Island theme park in Iowa is going to be like. Yeah. I haven't mean to video on that one. Yeah, it's really developing, isn't it? When is it opening? It's still set for some time this summer. They recently had, they actually had a queue burned down in a fire, but they did promise yeah. that it wasn't going to push back the opening date, mm -hmm. um, which you know, they're just right now saying sometime in summer. And it's just really going to be interesting to see a place that's going for theming right off the bat, an original concept sort of thing, in mm -hmm. a place that you would not think to build a heavily themed theme park because it's only going to, it's going to have, you know, a five, probably a five month season at best in Iowa, mm -hmm. but just, you know, they're swinging for the fences and I, I can't help but, but appreciate that and want to see how, how they do with it. Cause um, you know, it's the, it's the first time in a long time that something from the ground up new is being built outside of Orlando or California. That's going heavy on the theming. So mm -hmm. It'll be and I open. wonder if they build a lot of indoor attractions, then maybe they can stay open a little longer. I, I know they'll have at least one because the big thing they announced at the IAPA Expo when I was there was a uh, a Sally Dark Rides interactive shooting ride um, mm -hmm. that that would have to be indoors. So that could potentially stay open longer. Whether there's enough around that to support people coming into the park will be another mm -hmm. will be a different thing. Um, whether they can keep up the staffing and all that, but at least there's at least one you're right that could potentially be open longer. Um, then the other ones for, that are probably opening this year, um, I'm really interested to see how RE Force One, the RMC that's coming to Fun Spot oh, yeah. Atlanta, does. It's such a surprise that Fun Spot decided to invest there. And I'm a little skeptical whether that's a little too much too soon because for people who haven't been to Fun Spot Atlanta, there's like there's nothing else to keep you there. It's like it's sort of like you have a headlining coaster and then a huge Go gap, <laughs> a huge gap that maybe they should have spent like building up some supporting coasters before doing this big investment. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a little skeptical that people aren't going to come just ride that coaster and then you know coaster enthusiasts might get their three or four rides and then leave they'll still make a profit mm -hmm. off that paying per ride there uh but uh it's it's just it's just such a big investment and because they have the land a lot more land there to develop in atlanta than they do at their florida parks mm -hmm. um if they wanted to and this is successful they could start giving um you know six flags over georgia a run for their money in you know a decade or so if they build up enough and keep up that investment um which only mm -hmm. benefits the fans Six Flags would have to respond. It's always nice when a city, uh, you know, gives you two coaster parks to collect some more credits at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and uh, the last one I want to bring up is um, America Dryer Looping, the relocated Schwarzkopf that's going to Indiana oh, Beach. Yeah. Um, they used to be called Chimera that had a fatal accident on it. Really hoping they get those safety issues settled in a, <laughs> in a rebuild. Uh, but it's... It's such a big thing for Indiana Beach is my second home park because it's about a two hour drive away and seeing oh, yeah, makes sense. and seeing the investment uh, being put into that and getting a coaster. I mean, it's always nice when a Schwarzkopf gets saved. 
Um, yeah, I, 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 I personally, awesome. yeah, yeah. I personally prefer them a lot more than old arrow loopers, a lot smoother in my book. Um, looking at you, Viper. <laughs> oh God. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you just gave me like a sense memory of neck pain by bringing. <laughs> <it right. laughs> but yeah, those are those are the few things I'm looking at. A, a nice mix of like coasters going in place, bigger coasters going in places that there'll be really big headliners there, and then you know what are the big themed experiences happening? And especially if they're happening outside Orlando, they're being done by people other than Disney Universal. I'm all for it. Mm -hmm. Always, yeah, always get to you know spruce up. The competition in the game because then get a whole bunch of new things that maybe other people aren't trying out exactly well thank you so much for being on here it was a pleasure to have you everyone check out theme park tribune i'll leave a link below um and yeah I really, that's crazy i really thought you were in orlando insane he's in <laughs> chicago everybody <laughs> theme park tribune thank you so much or watching and subscribe more theme park updates and have a fantastic day. How do I? Okay.